Well, it was developed to uh, solve a, a perplexing problem that existed in poverty measurement. Um, everyone knew the uh, approach to measuring poverty using resources, using income, or using consumption spent by people. And this was, in fact, a very great step forward when income or expenditure became commonplace for measuring poverty. However, it became readily uh, understood that many aspects of poverty, in fact, some of the very uh, substantial part of the definition, might be missed through market activity and through things that could be purchased in the market. It was really Amartya Sen who brought us to that realization in saying equality of what, uh, therefore poverty of what. Well, that what should include things like capabilities that people have. These are not <laughs> directly purchasable in the marketplace. Consequently, uh, we try to go directly to the data and extract evidence of people's capabilities or uh, environment or other things that could condition them so as to be poor or not and put it directly into the definition of who is poor and how poor they are. We're trying to include missing dimensions of poverty directly in the definition and the way we measure poverty. Just think of the first thing you'd imagine as being education. A person's education controls so much of what they do, the decisions they make, what their life chances are. Similarly with health. If you can have evidence of a person's health, this might uh, explain what is going on in their lives more directly than simply seeing whether they go to the local marketplace. So these two and many more other conditions might be included in. Now in the data that you have in reality might not include exactly what you want, so you have to make compromises one way or the other. Uh, but living conditions have figured uh, in important ways, sanitation, uh, in some cases, jobs are extremely important, a great policy relevant variable that determines exactly what, whether a person is part of the mainstream or outside the mainstream uh, in a particular economy. So it, it really is, uh, there's a broader way, array of possible variables that could be included. Fortunately, I don't have to make the decision, nor do other poverty analysts have to make the decision all the time as to what is included, since governments are you know, taking this up and providing uh, uh, the power going to a committee to decide what should be included or not included in such an index. Because it all began with uh, Mexico, um, who came to me and a, f a few other people to ask how should we measure multidimensional poverty? And I asked the very natural question, why do you want to? measure multidimensional poverty. You have a perfectly good income-based approach that, in fact, I participated in just six years, four years earlier. And they said, well, a law was passed in the country which requires us to measure poverty based on this, 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 and this, and this dimension. So we simply have to find a way of combining these into a coherent and policy-relevant indicator. So they came to a number of people and asked uh, for uh, advice as to how to do this. Um, so it turned out that at that same time, I was working with Sabina Alkire at Oxford. She had come to a talk of mine on chronic poverty, and, it, and that technology was very, very similar to the kinds of multidimensional concerns, you know, many periods, many dimensions. Uh, so we were able to, she was actually able to convince me that it would work with multidimensional poverty. Uh, we then modified things, made it more reasonable, put it together, and out popped a, a way of looking at multidimensional poverty that seemed to have the right characteristics, which we then took back to the Mexican government. And the Mexican government all but adopted it as it, as it was. Um, so they took it up immediately because they had to. They had to take something that would be practical, that made sense, and incorporated in their world income with the other dimensions of uh, social dimensions, as they call them, that they needed to include into their overall poverty measurement. And then uh, down in uh, Latin America in, Mech in, uh, in Chile, there was a conference that was held shortly afterwards that attracted an incredible amount, number of people to uh, discuss the way that this uh, multidimensional poverty measurement was uh, being rolled out. And uh, uh, before long, Colombia came along and said, this is what we need. 
we have an income-based measure, but unlike Mexico, we're not going to include income in our measure. We want a multi-dimensional poverty measure here, which can, in fact, focus on the other dimensions of, of, uh, you know, of importance in life. And they immediately rolled it out. And uh, it has actually gone much further than we could imagine because the president has organized his cabinet, if you will, uh, using this measurement device to coordinate the activities of the Minister of Health, the Minister of Finance, the Minister of Education, so that everyone is accountable to everyone else. They meet on a regular basis with the president standing up before them saying, how much progress have we made on my promise to diminish poverty before the, the, my term is out? Within the UN system, it was an unusual situation that uh, uh, there came uh, Jenny Klugman into uh, the HDRO and uh, she wanted to innovate in measurement in the HDRO, the Human Development Report Office of the UNDP, and uh, approached Sabina and myself. And uh, in that year, 2010, the Multidimensional Poverty Index, so named <laughs> by a number of us, uh, came into existence. It was a particular calibration of our general approach to fit the needs of a cross-country or global measure of poverty, being able to evaluate 100 or more countries uh, at the same time. Uh, so that was implemented, um, of course, with cross-country situation. It's not anchored in a particular country's uh, important uh, dimensions, so there had to be some uh, arbit more arbitrariness in picking dimensions, cutoffs, you know, how, how far you would uh, uh, consider someone to be deprived before you'd say they're poor. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, you make the decision, go with it, see what happens, and the result is out there for all to see. You have an alternative way of looking at poverty to the simple dollar, dollar twenty-five uh, day a day approach of the World Bank. Well, it's, it's quite interesting. If you have a country that is rather high in income, but low in terms of uh, our measure, uh, they immediately want to find out, and many times they will register certain kinds of, um, of inquiries to, uh, to the office uh, in, in the UN. Uh, and it's led to very fruitful discussions. Morocco is one example that was wondering, now why are we in the position over here and over different? So if, if, if they look different to what they expect, the questions are raised, and guess what? That's what the whole business is about. What is happening with poverty in a country when you get to more basic fundamental dimensions and incorporate that into the poverty measurement. Uh, what's really happening? Governments stand up, take notice, and act upon it. I'm, I'm actually working on a, a project with the Asian Development Bank in defining and measuring inclusive growth. And it's clear that uh, the more usual notions of inclusive, inclusive growth are the vertical notion, which is, does growth, which is defined as a change in the mean income or per capita GDP, GNI, over time, uh, does that growth go to other parts of the income distribution than just the top or the middle? Where does it go? You know, who's, who benefits? And so that can be measured with poverty measures, with inequality measures, or as I gave in my talk yesterday, income standards income standards that stand for the entire distribution and are part and parcel of the measurement of poverty and inequality. Um, but this, uh, you know, this is just one way of looking at inclusive growth up and down the income distribution because it could be that groups are more important. And in fact, in many cases, group inequality is much more salient than overall inequality. The inequality between men and women's earnings is <laughs> a big issue. Uh, inequality across ethnic groups in countries uh, can tell you a lot, a lot about inequality of opportunities. And so the horizontal inequalities, to quote Francis Stewart of Oxford, uh, can many times loom much more important than the vertical inequalities that I mentioned previously. So there's, there's horizontal measures of inclusion. Are all groups included? In fact, it's reminiscent of the uh, education policy. Uh, no child left behind. Now the UN is saying no group left behind in the MDGs of the future. Uh, same thing here. 
It's including everyone in the growth process. But there's one additional way that you could think of inclusion, and that is inclusion across dimension. That we have growth in income is a good thing, but are we having growth in the other dimensions of life that are important for overall well-being? Is education improving along with income, or is that lagging behind? Is health improving, or is service delivery improving? And these are other things that could be mentioned, measured at the same time to evaluate the quality of growth. There's uh, the third dimension of inclusion is therefore across the different dimensions of well-being that people would find to be uh, important to them. And so this is called, uh, very naturally, dimensional inclusion. It's including uh, other dimensions of well-being into the growth process and analyzing it. Actually, all of this is just an empirical question. Is it happening or is it not? And I'm asking to take notice of these other ways, other things that are important that can come about through growth but may come about separately from growth at the same time as you look at growth as an indicator of development. We've undertaken studies with uh, my friends at OFI, the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, to evaluate how the multidimensional poverty index has been moving in conjunction with the growth rate in various countries. And it is surprising. Some countries have very fast income growth rates and naturally pretty good records in terms of income poverty. But when you look to the multidimensional poverty rate, it isn't changing anywhere as, as fast. Not much is occurring there. In other countries where there's a great deal of excitement uh, in terms of the variables that people care about in their life, but they don't uh, see much excitement going on in income right now, well, you might say, well, there's a lot happening in multidimensional poverty now, even though income isn't changing much. The amount of change in multidimensional poverty is great per unit of change in income. That's something to know. It tells you something about the quality of the growth that's in that particular country. Well, I mean, to someone who's worked with Amartya Sen and has, in fact, taught classes with, with Sen, um, you understand that this particular institution has a special significance in the way of thinking about development. Um, the whole idea of human development as an important criterion by which to judge development processes stems from that and stems from that group of people who had the foresight to come together and create the institute. So I've known about this for quite a while. I met Amartya Sen um, through the mail as an undergraduate student in 1976. So I've been aware of the kinds of things that have been going on over time and from a distance, and it's been quite exciting. Uh, but the interesting thing is that this is where a lot of the thought carries on, where the uh, kind of moral compass of the development economics uh, community is, is really set for a significant number of us. Uh, I've been coming here for quite a while. I've seen many directors. I've seen some very interesting projects and had many of my papers come out of this building, including one on robustness of uh, the Human Development Index and other composite indicators. It was developed down the hall with Mark McGillivray when he was here. Uh, and in fact, uh, work with Tony Shorox was done when he, when he was here. Uh, many people, the reason why it's such um, an exciting environment is that when we come here and visit for a short time, uh, ideas come together immediately and we produce interesting results. 